Well, good evening, Southside. It's an absolute joy to be back here with you all. I think this is our third time we've visited here. And uh, very grateful to Pastor Joseph and, and the elders for the invitation to be here and to take part in your missions conference. I was here two years ago with, if you remember, uh, Jeremy Morris, great friend, off in Egypt at the moment, and uh, we love to hear the good reports from them as well. So yeah, it's, it's great to be here, love being with you all. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephen Musler. I'm here with my wife, Tanya, back there. And uh, we, we're from South Africa. You probably can hear that my American is not as good as yours. <laughs> so um, I'll do my best. I hope you get to understand me. Um, but I came to LA in 2019 to do my seminary studies. And uh, we moved out here in December 2018. And, and it was there that I met Pastor Joseph and his family and Pastor Rick and uh, met Judy there as well. And so uh, just brothers in arms, really, at the end of the day. We were speaking about it just before we came up here. Uh, we were in the trenches together in seminary and uh, loved these brothers so much. As you know, some of you may know, I represent an organization called African Revitalization Center, which really aims to train and resource African pastors. There's, as I said when I was here the last time, there's no shortage of churches in, in Africa, but they just some of, most of them are really, really bad for lack of training, lack of resources, lack of understanding. And so we serve those men to try and elevate their ministry so that they can feed the flock better. And that's what I do. And there's so much that the Lord has graciously allowed us to do. Uh, that God has been kind to us. He's opened up incredible doors. And I've put together a, 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 just a packet of an update, which I emailed to Pastor Joseph today. And I'm sure he'll send it out to all of you so you can read it and uh, keep up to date with what we've been doing. Um, but when it comes to missions, talking about missions this weekend, uh, there's so much in my heart. It's such a big topic, what you talk about. And I've got so much that I'd, I'd love to say. But maybe I can just start with a short testimony. Um, I was uh, in a church for 26 years uh, where my wife and I were married in that church. We raised our families there. I was an elder in that church. And um, I always thought, as my job as one of the preaching elders, uh, to take care of the home base. And that's what I did. I took care of it. And I never wanted to really be involved in missions or that understanding of missions where you go. I, I would say, you guys go, I'll take care of the home base. And I did that for a long time. And eventually, one of the elders wore me down. And, he, and I agreed to go and went on a mission trip into a very rural, into the heart, really, of Angola. And uh, it was an extreme trip, but it was there that I understood, finally, what the call to missions was all about uh, and what, how the blessing it was more to me than it was to those that I went to serve. And I've never looked back. On a recent trip up in Kenya, uh, I had the joy of one of the Grace Community Church elders traveled with me on that trip. And uh, at one point, we were traveling from Mombasa up all the way along the coastline north to the equator. And uh, we were stopping at regular intervals to, to meet with groups of pastors who'd gathered. They were waiting for us. And we met with them and just sat and listened and learned from them. And it was an incredible time. One, one such pastor was a young guy called Edward. Uh, he's 25 years old. He'd only been saved for five years. Um, to care for his family in the week, he goes off into the African bush and he cuts wood and then he burns that wood, makes charcoal, and then he sells it next to the road. Uh, to make money to feed his family. That's what he does from Monday to Friday. And then Saturday, he prepares to preach, and then Sunday all day, 
He serves his church. He preaches. He counsels. He does everything that he does for the church on a Sunday. And so we, as we were talking, I said to him, so tell me about the literacy in your church. And he said, well, about half of his church can read Swahili. And I said, okay, that's quite, quite a high number for Africa. So, so I said, would, would those all typically have Bibles? And his face lit up, literally lit up with his big smile. And he says, no, but in our church, we have three Bibles. This is a church of 250 people. We have three Bibles. The church down the road, only the pastor has a Bible. But he had this big smile on his face. And we were humbled. We were heartbroken. Um, we were led to tears. We spent hours with these guys and just listening to their love for their flock and their, their love for God and the love for Christ and their desire to feed their flock well. Their commitment to the church, it literally led us to tears. When we got back to L.A. and um, back to Grace Church, that same elder called me aside one day and he said to me, you know, Stephen, I've, I've heard all the reports. I've, I've always had all the feedback from the missionaries come to me. Um, I read the reports. Um, I attend all the meetings. He said... But until now, I've actually never really understood. I've never understood what it is that you guys do. And to me, that was a real blessing. But friends, what I want to say to you is that there's a, there's a very real dynamic that's unmistakable about being in the mission field, about going into Africa, about going to South America, going to Indonesia or India or any one of these places, that's true. But I want to say to you that there's so much more to missions than that. I would have that every single one of you here would get on a plane and go, whether it's national or whether it's international, to go. I would love that. Because I understand the blessing of being the one who goes to give, but I always come back having received so much more. I'd love for every one of you to have a heart that, as Pastor Joseph and Pastor Rick were saying, hold the rope in all those things that he had up there to give and to pray and to be a part of that. Because I know how tough it is for these men on the ground in the mission field. But long before we even get to that point, I would have it that we have the hearts that understand the mission of the church. Hearts that get it. Hearts that undergird the mission of the church as we read it in the Great Commission. And so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28. And we are going to look at this passage called, in most Bibles, the Great Commission. Matthew 28 right at the end, verse 16. And in this passage, we will look at three heart attitudes, the heart attitudes of every believer that will actually work to undergird the mission of the church, the Great Commission. It's not a complicated thing, but oh, it's so, so profound. Matthew 28, verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I've commanded you and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's just pray together. Father, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you that when we hear these words spoken from your very mouth, from the mouth of our Father who loved us so much, 
Through Christ, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. Thank you that we can know and experience eternal life and that we have the massive, massive privilege of sharing this truth, the truth of our Lord and Savior with all those around us. May you, by by your Spirit, open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us in your word tonight. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. So the year was 1792. A guy called William Carey, who was later dubbed the father of the modern mission movement, he challenged his Baptist brothers in England to obey the responsibility of the church to go and take the gospel to unreached lands. The Baptists then got together and they formed an organization called, listen to this, the particular Baptist Society for Propagating the Gospel Among the Heathen. Okay, quite a name. And they appointed William Carey and a guy called John Thomas to go to India as missionaries. So in 1793, William Carey said a very tearful goodbye to his church in Leicester in England. And then the next day, the society came together and to give them a big farewell. It was an all-day Event And at this event, um, some of the leaders, four of the leaders of the society met with Carey and um, promised him, and this is what they promised. They said, as you go forth in the society's name and our masters, we should never cease till death to stand by you. That's a commitment they made. One of those guys was a guy called Andrew Fuller, and he later described this meeting as with an analogy. He said that the mission to India seemed like a few men who were considered going into a deep, deep mine shaft, unexplored mine. And it's as if Carrie said, well, I'll go down if you hold the rope. That's where the holding the rope comes from. The meeting in Fuller's mind was as if he and the other brethren that were there gave their word that whilst he was living, they would never let go of the rope. And friends, today missionaries are still the same. They are still going down into that mine, seeking to win those who've never heard the gospel, to spread the gospel in the most unreached parts of the earth to shine the light of the gospel in the darkest places of this planet. And they are still very reliant on those who hold the rope. This analogy has stuck and has been used ever since as a picture of missions, but it's great because it is a biblical truth that it portrays. Because God designed New Testament missions to be a team effort right? And so you, say, you may say to yourself, well, what does it take to be on that team? And let me answer you f- by saying this first. I think Pastor Rick said it, or you may even have said it already. Every one of you sitting here are called to be involved in the Great Commission. Every single one. If you're a true born-again believer and you're a child of the living God, whether you go into the mission field or whether you stay here, it doesn't matter what you do, you're called to embrace the mission of the church. Whether you're going down into mine or you're holding the rope, you're called to do so with the same vigor and the same passion as the ones who go. It doesn't matter which of the two you are. The reality is, if you are holding that rope so tightly, then your hands will get scuffed. You're going to get calluses on your hands. You'll get scarred by that rope. Not so. If you're on the top of that mine shaft holding that rope, you will have the same scars as the guys who are climbing down that deep into the mind. They may be in more physical danger than you, 
but you're together on the mission. So think of it. Look at your hands right now and ask, what do you see? And this is where it becomes interesting. Because as you look at your hands, the typical answers that come to your mind is, well, I pay my tithe, and our church supports missions, right? Friends, I'm asking you tonight, do not hide behind a biblical church. You can say, our church is involved in missions, but that's not going to be the question that is asked of you on Judgment Day. The question on Judgment Day is, are you involved in missions? Well, our church does a lot. I know. I know. This church does a lot. But do you? Do you? What's going on in your heart? And friends, I want to say as well that holding the rope in the mission of the church involves way more than just giving your money and praying and sending cards. All of those are vital. All of those are necessary. Those are the practical outworking of something that is far more deeper and far more profound. Holding the rope in the mission of the church to the extent that it scuffs your hands as a believer has to do with what's going on in your heart. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage today. We're going to look at three heart attitudes in this passage that undergirds the mission of the church. The kind of heart attitudes that are required of you if you are one who can say, I truly hold on to this rope. Look with me at verse 16. Verse 16, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now, first of all, this is important because it comes up again much later. We have to ask, what is a disciple? Now, according to the dictionary, a disciple is a person who is learning from another by instruction. It may be formal learning. It may be informal learning. It's a pupil of some kind, a student. And so here it's referring to the 11 men who had been with Jesus for about three and a half years, learning from him as they went along. Now, as you can see, the text says there were 11. We know that by this time, Judas had fallen out. He was dead after his betrayal of Jesus. And so we only have these 11 left. What do we know about them? Well, we know that Andrew, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. We don't know for real, but we know that Thomas and Nathaniel and Philip, they may also have been fishermen because they were on the boat with the others when Jesus came to them in John 21. We know Matthew was a tax collector and Simon the Zealot was involved in politics. They were ordinary people just like you and me. And yet so often when we think of these, when we read this passage about the 11 disciples here, we think of them as the apostles. We think of them as mighty men of God, the writers of Scripture. We see them as having some kind of a superior spiritual maturity. And this is something that we often wait for as we consider serving the Lord, right? We hold back. But friends, this was not the case with these 11 guys. For three and a half years, they walked with Jesus. And what do we see? Well, we don't see men of great strength. We don't see men of great wisdom. We don't see men who are quick to learn. What we do see is men who displayed incredible cowardice. We see men who were arrogant, men who were self-righteous. Peter was a guy who was born with a foot-shaped mouth. 
Every time he opened it, he got into trouble. Well, often he did. These are the things, friends, that we see in ourselves every day, the things we struggle with. But what do we know? What do we find here in verse 16? Is we find men who were willing to proceed. They were willing to proceed. Why? Because they'd walked with Jesus. From the moment they were called, they walked with Christ, and he taught them, and he molded them, and he shaped them to become more and more and more like him. They solidly believed that he was their Messiah. And friends, it's no different for you and me. From the moment we, we recognize that Jesus died in our place on the cross, we are justified. We have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And we are made to be in the eyes of the Father just as if we had never sinned. And from that moment on, we are justified. We enter into a lifelong process of sanctification, of being molded and shaped by the Holy Spirit to becoming more and more and more like Christ. So we know different to these disciples. And just as it was with the disciples, they started exactly where every one of us do, right? Their journey started in the same place. And so, friends, I want to say to you, if you're a, a new believer or if you've been saved for a long time, you all start in the same place. And, as, and you begin to follow Him. And you begin to serve Him. And you begin to walk with Him just as you are. This, friends, what we're talking about here is not about spiritual perfection. It's not about Christian maturity. It's about a willingness to proceed and move. It's about advancing. Some grow slowly. Some grow quickly. Some are, are race horses. Some are plow horses. Some, in their sanctification, they go forward three steps and back two. It does not matter. What matters is are you moving forward? Are you willing to proceed to serve Christ? We know the parable of the talents. Some people are, giving, uh, are given many talents, others few. It does not matter because in God's sovereign providence, all he expects is for you to use what he has given you. That's all he asks. That's all he wants. Friends, if you are waiting to reach some level of spiritual maturity before you join the war, chances are good. You'll never join the war. So the first attitude of the heart required for the church as a whole to fulfill its mission, the Great Commission, is for believers to be available. To be available. John MacArthur comments on this. He says this, and I like it. He says, as far as a believer's service to God is concerned, the greatest ability is availability. I like that. The most talented and gifted Christian is useless to God if he's not available to be used. And this availability simply comes in the form of being willing to obey Christ and to follow him and to serve him. And so some of you may say, well, I'm older now. I've missed my opportunity. And friend, if that's you, I want to give you an old Chinese proverb that says this. It says, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is now. Okay? It's as simple as that. Don't conceal yourself and hide away in a biblical church. You are responsible before God, as it says here, to proceed. 
Maybe you've said to yourself before, well, I'm in a good church where the Word of God is preached every week, and I go every week, I'm faithful. Friends, I've said it before, that will not matter on Judgment Day. James speaks of it when he says that faith without works is dead. What matters is your response to the preaching of the Word. How do you respond? And that response will be proven by your availability for real and practical service. And that happens first of all, and I know that we're talking about a missions weekend, but that's why I said to you, friends, this is far deeper and far more than, than just the ends of the earth. Because this kind of practical uh, uh, outworking of your mission as part of the mission of the church starts in your family. It starts in your community, in your local church. And then, like with Daniel, it goes to your nation. And then after that, like with Jeremy, it goes international. That's what it means to be a part of holding that rope. It means in your heart to be available to proceed. So we see the disciples were available and they proceeded. The second attitude of the heart required for the church to fulfill its great commission is for believers to have a heart that truly worships God. True worship. We know before the, res the resurrection and after the resurrection, Jesus had said that he would meet the disciples in Galilee. We saw that in Matthew 26, 32, and 28, 7. And so in obedience and in faith, they proceeded and they went to Galilee. And here in Matthew 28, 17, we find them at a particular mountain that Jesus had designated at some point or the other for them to meet at. And then verse 17, it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, friends, we saw earlier in verse 9 when Jesus met and he greeted Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Uh, they were on their way to go and tell the disciples what had happened at the tomb. And then Jesus met them, and it says they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. And here in verse 17, we see the disciples doing the same thing. And the message to us, and this is clear, friends, you cannot see the risen Christ and not worship. You cannot. Think about this for a minute. It's, it's unbelievable. Jesus, who had meant so much to them, they'd spent so much time with him, and all throughout his earthly ministry, he was with them, and then he dies. And here, he's standing right in front of them, very clearly stronger and mightier than death, because here he is very much alive. This was different than it was before. We saw earlier in chapter 14, when Jesus was walking on water to the boat that they were on, after getting into the boat, the disciples who were on the boat, it says in Matthew 14, 33, they worshipped him saying, you are truly God's son. Now they may have, they may have admitted that, they may have said that there, but they could have only believed it up to a point. But here in Matthew 28, it's different because now they had witnessed the crucifixion. They had seen their master die on that cross. And here they were seeing again alive. This was a testimony of his deity. And no doubt they fell to the floor before him in reverence and in awe that they were in the presence of their Savior and their God. 
They'd heard him say before many times, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But now there was no doubt in their mind that this Jesus that they loved and served and walked with is God. They were in the presence of God himself. And then immediately the text tells us, almost as if contrasting the deity of Christ and, and the majesty of God with the fallibility of man. Because it says in verse 17 that some of them doubted. Even though they were prostrate before Jesus, worshiping, there were some that doubted. Now that may seem very strange to us. Why would they doubt? This is Jesus right in front of them. What is there to doubt? What kind of doubt does Matthew have in mind? Well, to answer that question, we've got to go back again to Matthew 14. So turn with me quickly in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, and we'll pick up the story in verse 26. Now, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And getting out of the boat, Peter walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took a hold of him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and when they got into the boat the wind stopped friends the the word used here and in Matthew 28 verse 17 for doubt is the word distazo and it refers to a hesitation it refers more to that than it does to unbelief well, our, our leading Greek dictionary defines this word distazo as being uncertain about taking a particular course of action or to hesitate. And so when Peter saw the wind, which no doubt caused waves, he became fearful and he hesitated. And he started to sink. And Jesus said to him, why did you do that? Why did you doubt? Now we know that there were those who genuinely did not believe that Jesus had been resurrected. The two guys on the way to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13. And then also in Luke, we have the account of where Jesus first came to the disciples and, and they were startled and they were frightened and they thought they were seeing a ghost. And then verse 38 of Luke 24 He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Friends, the word therefore doubt is dialogismos, which means a thought or a reasoning or an opinion of dispute or argument. In other words, unbelief. It's not the same word that's used in Matthew 28. In other words, These guys here, in verse 38, they could not believe that this was really Jesus. But in Matthew 28, it's not that kind of doubt. They were worshiping their Christ. They were worshiping their Savior. But rather than unbelief, they had an uncertainty about how to act in this situation. For here, they were undoubtedly in the presence of God. Think about that for a minute. Can you imagine the scene? We, we know what happened to Isaiah. I've always got to remember how to say that. We, we say Isaiah. You guys say I, Isaiah. Think about what happened to him when he saw himself in the presence of God. What happened? He was so overwhelmed. In, a, in Isaiah 6, 5, he said, woe is me. For I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. 
and hear the disciples lying on their faces before God. They were in the presence of the Almighty and the Holy God. And I have no doubt in my mind that just like Isaiah, they were confronted with their own weaknesses and their own fallibility and their own frailties and their own sinfulness. And when it says some of them doubted, I think they were saying, woe is me. But not just that. Their hesitance must have been fueled by fear about what is lying ahead. What's going to happen to us now? What is coming? But friend, the encouragement for us tonight in this is that in the face of their own weaknesses and in the face of their own sin, these same men who doubted, these same men who were hesitant, these same men who were fearful, they were the same men who went and they turned the world upside down. Friends, it's not about power. It's not about wisdom. It's not about knowledge of men. It's about recognizing our absolute inability to do anything and our absolute dependence upon Christ. Right? Friends, this is the heart of true worship that's needed to hold the rope in the mission of the church. It's a heart that worships the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, and recognizes Him as being all-sufficient and all-powerful in every way to achieve anything according to His riches in glory, especially in the light of our own inability. The challenge for us today is not to allow our weakness and our frailties to keep us from serving Christ. We cannot allow that to keep us from holding the rope in the mission of the church. To submit to His Lordship, to recognize our need of Him, to be broken and small and weak and nothing, so that through Him, His power will shine forth His glory and His strength. Friends, it says here that some doubted they were just like us. Every one of them. Paul doubted. Paul struggled. He struggled with weakness. He prayed and asked the Lord to take it away. And his own testimony, he said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said, and he said to me, saying, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. He struggled with the same things. The psalmist Asaph he testified to the same thing in Psalm 73, 26. And I love this. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. Credible passage. Friends, we all doubt. We doubt our abilities. We doubt. I doubt. Sometimes I I, I get fearful when I think of the scale of the war that we're in. The job at hand. And sometimes I doubt even if the mission of the church is even possible in my weakness. A recent study showed that there are some 2.3 billion people on this planet who profess to be Christians of some kind. They identify as Christians, but that includes all those who identify as Christian by birth. It includes the Catholics. It includes the, the Orthodox religions. It includes the crazy charismatics out there. The sad reality is that the same research shows us that it's only about 285 million people on this planet who classify as true Bible believing evangelical Christians. Friends, that's 3.56% of the population. 
scares me. It scares me when I look at the state of the evangelical church in this day and age, where so many churches are embracing all kinds of woke and unbiblical philosophies in their ecclesiology. It scares me. It scares me when I read the Institute for Family Studies, the report on sex and the single uh, evangelical, to find that 75% of evangelical Christian young people between the ages of 18 and 22 have been sexually active with at least one partner. 75%. It scares me. I start to doubt this army that I'm fighting with right? It should scare all of us. Paul Washer, talking about this thing, about the state of the evangelical church, he said this. He said, sometimes I think it would do Christianity a great service if most evangelicals would just turn their back on Christ and walk away and deny him. Because their testimony does far more damage to the cause of Christ than their denial would. That's a sad thing. It's a sad indictment on the church. He says, and if they did deny him publicly, it would not be a new thing in their life. It would just be a public manifestation of what is a real reality in their life. They really don't know him. Friends, do you really know him? Do you really know him? Do you really follow him? Do you really worship him? The point that you could say, my heart, my flesh may fail, but God is the rock of my heart, my portion forever. Do you say in your heart most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me? Friends, this is what it means to hold the rope in the mission of the church. We should live lives that are different to the world. We should all be the vindication of Christ's resurrection. People should look at us and say, Christ must have risen because look at that guy. Look at what he does. That's what we saw in the disciples. Even though they doubted, they were available. They worshiped their resurrected Lord, verse 16 and verse 17. And before we move on to verse 18, I want to add just one more disclaimer. Because even right here in verse 17, these 11 men were not yet the 11 men who went and turned the world upside down. Yes, there they were. They were witnesses of the resurrected Christ. They knew it enough to prostrate themselves before him and worship him, but they doubted. They were still fearful. And so you ask yourself the question, what happened to them? What changed? What made the difference? What transformed these men to fearlessly go into all the world and to proclaim the gospel boldly and for most of them eventually to die a martyr's death? what happened? And friends, the answer is very simple. It was the day of Pentecost. It was a unique event that's recorded for us in Acts 2, verse 1 to 4. After Jesus had ascended into heaven, it says, suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they, that's the disciples, were sitting. And there they appeared to them, tongues like fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Friends, this was a unique fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And it was right after that event that the disciples went out, they were enabled, they were empowered, they were strengthened, they were full of the Holy Spirit, and they went forth and they turned the world upside down. So the question immediately gets asked, well, do we have to wait for the same thing to happen to us? And the answer, of course, is no. 
because every time a person believes the gospel unto salvation, you all know this, it's the result of the regenerating work of the Spirit in that person's life. And the moment they are saved, they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the instant that they are, they're enabled, they're empowered, and they're strengthened by the Spirit of God to go and do exactly what the disciples did, right? They went and turned the world upside down. And so you say, why did they do that? Why did they go and do that? And the answer is simple. It's the third heart attitude that was evident in their life. Not only were they available to God with hearts that worshipped Him, but the incredible fruit of their ministry testifies to the fact that when they found themselves in front of Jesus here in Matthew 28, they had hearts that were absolutely submissive to his lordship. They were willing to submit to his instruction. Here they were, 11 men, frightened, full of doubt, full of hesitation about the future, uncertain about what's coming, and they're sitting there in the presence of the almighty God, and true to his very nature, seeing their fear and everything, in a way to alleviate any doubts they may have, just as he always does, he initiates communication with them and relationship with them, and it says he came to them. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. MacArthur said this, he said, whatever the doubt was, as the Lord came nearer and his familiar voice sounded in their ears, once again, all uncertainty was erased. Nothing else mattered now. They were now in the presence of the living God. Friends, the, the resurrected king, the Lord, the king of the universe, once again humbles himself, comes towards his disciples, and he reiterates to them what they already know. Here Jesus is no longer this suffering servant anymore. Isaiah calls him a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This is not the Jesus anymore. No, he now has all authority and power. He's making clear to them that whatever limitations that apply throughout his incarnation, those no longer apply to him, and he now has the supreme authority throughout the universe. Peter said the same thing in Acts 2, in verse 36. He says, Let all of the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ. And so with his authority firmly established in the minds of the disciples, in verse 19, Jesus uses the word, therefore. That's a very important word, a therefore. In other words, it goes without saying that if you recognize the resurrected Lord as God, as ruler of the universe, if you can testify with Paul in Colossians 1.15 saying that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, that he is before all things and in him all things hold together, if you can agree that he is the head of the body, the church, that he is the beginning, that he will come to have first place in everything, and that he is the fullness of God, if Jesus truly is the Lord and master of your life, then it goes without saying that you will be obedient to his instruction, right? Of course it is. And here in Matthew 28, verse 19, this is made abundantly clear. Jesus simply says, he doesn't make excuse or anything, and without equivocation, he says, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations. 
Simple as that. That's his instruction. Very simple. But I want you to be careful here and to track with me. Because many use this text as the go-to text for missions, for international missions. This is the go-to text to get you to get on a plane and go to some foreign country. I mean, there it is, isn't it? Two verbs, two instructions. One, go. Two, make disciples. Two verbs joined by a conjunction. But friends, the truth is that of these two verbs, only one is an imperative. And that one is to make disciples. When Jesus says to the disciples, go, he's using a verb form known as a participle. And what a participle does is very interesting, and it can essentially be translated here that says, as you go along, or as you are going, make disciples. And so what he's saying to them is this. He says, guys, from this day forward, as you live your life as believers, as you go along, as you go wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. And what does it mean to make disciples of all nations? In other words, he's saying to them, as you're going along, as you live your life as a believer from this day forward, evangelize and share the gospel with everybody that you possibly can. All people everywhere, all over the planet, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your school, in your workplace, in your country, and in every country of the world. And when you've shared the gospel, you make disciples of those who believe. Remember I said in the beginning, we're going to come back to it. What is a disciple? He's a learner. An unbeliever is not going to be a learner. So you have to evangelize them first. And then in response to sharing the gospel with all those people, those who by the Spirit of God are enabled to believe and respond in faith and are saved, what do you do with them? You baptize them. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them to keep the, all that I commanded you. Friends, our, our, our call, the mission of the church is to evangelize the world. And those who are saved are to be baptized and discipled. And then we have this incredible promise from our Lord, Matthew 28, 20. And he says, Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, this, it's almost as if he just needed to give them some extra encouragement especially those who were doubting, to put to rest their fearful and their hesitant hearts. Remember, at this point in time, Pentecost had not happened yet. These guys were scared. And he says to them, don't worry, because I will be with you. And of course, we know that he's with us, because since the day of Pentecost, his spirit dwells within us. We don't have to fear. We don't have to doubt. We do not have to hesitate. We don't have to worry about anything. It doesn't matter which side of the rope you're holding on to. If you are available to serve our Lord, and if you worship Him with awe and reverence for what He has done for you on the cross, and if you surrender your life to His Lordship and obey His instruction and His, his call to serve him in the Great Commission, he will be with you even to the very end. Right? If that's your heart already today, then you can look at your hands and you will see those scuff marks there already. If that's not you today, I want to remind you that the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The next best time is today, right? Repent, 
and resolve in your heart to, to be one who holds tightly onto the rope of the mission of the church, knowing full well that the God of the universe is on your side. And so the next question as we, as we consider this whole passage and these three heart attitudes, if you realize today that you want to plant that tree today, and you, you ask yourself the question, well then, how do I do that, and how do I practically get involved in holding the rope? Speak to your pastor. He will tell you. They will gladly, your elders will gladly tell you how you can get involved in this great mission of the church. If you need help to learn how to evangelize your neighbors, speak to your elders. They will train you. They will help you. If the Lord is moving in your heart to go internationally or nationally to go and serve in a church somewhere that needs help, Speak to your elders. They will guide you and they will lead you through that process. I'll leave you with three very famous words when it comes to all that we've spoken about. And those words are simply, just do it. Amen? Let's pray. Our great heavenly Father, blessed Son, eternal spirit we come to worship you god in three persons one in essence perfect in every way the only true god our hearts are full of gratitude for the redemption that we have in christ applied to us by your spirit and lord undeserving as we are you've welcomed us into your everlasting kingdom so that we might be partakers of your unspeakable glory oh god we praise you we thank you for your mercy so undeserved for your grace beyond measure your loving kindness that's inexhaustible your mercies that endure forever your faithfulness that extends to all generations your glory that's seen in all your works and your steadfast love for us. And so, Father, tonight as we end this evening, we ask humbly that you would strengthen us in our doubts, that you would encourage us in those areas where we are, where we, where we are weak, that you would embolden us, that you would empower us to serve you and humble us, Lord, in our acts of worship and service in the great mission of the church. Father, we pray that you would be honored through our lives. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, just a, a note. I've, I've brought two cards along. One is just a a card like this that just gives a little bit of detail about who we are and what we do as ARC, um, African Revitalization Center. But this, this one in particular is something that is very dear to our hearts. As I said, we go to these pastors. One of the biggest challenges they have is that they have no resources. They have no books that they can study from to feed their flock well. And so what we did with the help of uh, TMAI and Rick Cress from TMAI, we, we went to the publishers um, of books that we recommend for every pastor to have, and we drew, drew up a list of 33 titles. These are commentaries, these are dictionaries, these are introductions, uh, systematic theologies, pastoral ministry tools. It's a library of 33 books that are essential to every pastor. And so we went to the, to the publishers and we negotiated with them and they've given us the rights to print these books in Africa. And so that makes it so much cheaper than shipping it. And so to give you an idea, this list of 33 books is somewhere in the region of about $3,000. Uh, $3, um, for the whole list. 
we can print all 33 in Africa for $110. And so we are raising funds. We've paid all the licensing fees. We want to do a first run of 1,000 libraries in the next six months. And um, we've already got partnerships with printers in South Africa and in Zambia who are going to print and distribute these libraries to pastors that we are working with all over. And uh, we're going to do that for $110 for a box of 33 books. So we're very grateful to the printers for their uh, support as well and for the publishers who've literally, um, initially, to give you an example, Moody, um, when Moody came back to us, they said $2 a book uh, royalty fee. And by the time that we signed the contract, they'd actually come back with 10 cents a book uh, for a license fee. And so they were very gracious, and uh, we're very grateful to the Lord for what he's done. So there's a card there. If any of you would like to support that ministry, there's a QR code that takes you there. And we're grateful for every bit that comes in. Um, we are looking forward to doing the first run. All thousand libraries have already been assigned. Um, and so we're already negotiating with the publishers for the next thousand. So incredible thing. So thank you again to the elders for the privilege to share the word of God with you. And I wish you all a good night. These guys will give out those cards. Joe. Some more of the information there I can bring it around for us I want to just close this out here for the evening remind you that we start at nine o'clock tomorrow morning and uh, Sam Lampy uh, will be here to share with us uh, first thing early in the morning uh, we'll be talking about evangelism and uh, we look very forward to our time with him in the morning and then we'll continue on uh, through the remainder of the morning with with worship and Stephen will uh, be bringing the message for us again tomorrow morning uh, through our main worship service and we'll share another meal afterwards and have an opportunity we hope and pray that uh, all the technology will work and uh, we know that the Lord has sovereignty even over that stuff maybe especially over that stuff when we really need it and we'll get to have a conversation on the screen uh, with Jeremy Morris tomorrow as well so with that let's go ahead and close in prayer and uh, we'll dismiss for the evening. Heavenly Father, thank you again so much <laughs> for giving us a task that is a great task. Lord, you gave us a task that we could not perform of our own strength, but you did not leave it to us to be performed of our own strength. You've given us your strength. Thank you, Lord, that you closed that commission with the promise that you would be with your disciples to the very end of the age, no matter where we go. Thank you for that encouragement, Lord. Thank you for the encouragement and for the exhortation tonight, Father, that we need to hear. We know that you are a kind and gracious and loving Father, and you and your kindness and love correct your children. In light of that, Lord, I pray for each one of us here, myself included, that you would go with us tonight. Help us to meditate on what we've heard. Write it deeply onto our hearts, Lord, that it may not be removed. Leave an indelible mark of your word with your commission and your purpose and your worthiness to be worshipped because you are the risen Lord and Savior. You are God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, sustainer of all things, all the time. And yet you draw near to us, and you speak to us, and you love us, and you teach us, and you show us your strength in our weakness. Help each one of us, Lord, tonight to think about the talent 
that you've given us. And give us the courage. And not even just the courage, Lord, but the willing desire to invest it for your namesake. Wholeheartedly knowing that you reap a reward where you have not sown. We can invest all that you've given to us, no matter what that may be, with tremendous confidence of returns beyond what we can even imagine. Thank you, God, for giving us this message tonight. Thank you, God, for giving us your son, for giving us forgiveness, for giving us justification, for giving us eternal life in the hope of seeing you face to face and living in the light of your glory forevermore. You are such a great and mighty God, and we thank you for the good gifts that you give. Go with us tonight, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.